Okay, here's our fourth objective, our final objective for this, and some may consider it too long lesson, whatever. Everybody has their own opinion. Um, so you're going to be able to use Descartes' rule of signs to help us figure out the number of possible positive or negative real zeros. It's going to be another one of the shortcuts that we could use when we have a list of um, the list of possibilities, rational zeros, that we could choose from those things. All right, so in the picture there, there's a caricature, a sketch of Descartes. You can see that he had a very pronounced nose. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, quite a fantastic mustache there, yes. So he's on here because that's, I mean, it's his rule, right? It's his rules. Um, so he lived a long time ago, been dead. He is, or he was, of course, a French philosopher, René Descartes. He's got a girl's name, or he had one. Um, and and uh, he was responsible for, or, or he's considered the father of rational thought. Um, so if you don't like rational thought, if you prefer um, irrational thought, this is the guy to blame. And uh, he, one of his most famous mottos or saying is, cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am. So if you've heard that before, that's the guy it comes from. He and uh, says on here that he taught a fly, or no, 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 let me, let me back that up. A fly taught him the Cartesian coordinate plane and he took complete credit for it. So the Cartesian coordinate plane is what you are used to calling a piece of graph paper um, or, you know, an XY coordinate system that you draw a graph on he made that thing up and he's he's the one that's responsible for laying that kind of um, bringing geometry and, and algebra kind of together laying the groundwork for calculus that's this guy so um, here's his rules rules of signs so we have ourselves a polynomial function and uh, again don't let the math of it like discourage you or frighten you away. The little A's with the subscripts, those are all just real numbers. And the little X's, those are the exponents. And we're going, we're in standard form, going from highest power down to lowest power. Okay? So this is what he says. Rule number one is the number of positive real zeros. Stop right there. Positive real zeros does not mean any imaginary ones, just the real ones. And positive means, can it be zero? No. Okay. The number of positive real zeros of that function of f is equal to the number of sign changes, in other words, from positive or negative or negative to positive in that function, um, or less than that by an even number. The reason why it's less than that by an even number is because it's possible that those are imaginary and they're not going to be x-intercepts. And those things, as we saw in the previous example or the previous objective, they come in pairs. Okay, if I look at the second rule down here in red, it's just like the first rule, except for it has to do with the number of negative real zeros. But first, you have to change the function. You have to find f of negative x. And you will see in just a little bit, the shortcut to that is to change all the signs of the odd ones and keep all the signs of the even powered terms the same. Because if I take a negative and I raise it to an even power, it's still whatever the sign was originally. But uh, an odd number to a negative, so a negative 1 raised to the third power is still negative 1. Okay. Um, or less than that by an even number. These rules probably won't make any sense to you until we look at an example. So let's do that. Let's look at an example. And we'll summarize the rules of what, how you're supposed to use them. So use Descartes' rule of signs to determine the possible number of positive real zeros, negative real zeros, and imaginary. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Imaginary ones? The, let me go back here. This is only something about real ones, positive real ones and negative real ones. So I'm going to show you how to figure out, doing some very basic arithmetic, how to get the imaginary ones after we found the reals, uh, the positives and the negatives. So here is our polynomial equation. Tell me. How many zeros should we expect to get? Look at that degree right there. That degree right there is telling me um, that I should expect to get six. Let me just go ahead and write that on there. So I should get six 
zeros. Now right below, I've already animated though, I'm looking for sign changes. I'm looking for where the coefficients are going from positive to negative or negative to positive. So on the first one, I'm going to pop from positive 6x to the 2x to the 6 to negative 3x squared, there's a sign change. And then it switches, that stays negative for the next one, then it switches from negative to positive, from negative x to positive 1. So that's two positive real zeros. And then it, the second part of the rule says, or less than that by an even number. So I have two. If I subtract two from that, I'm left with zero. And the reason why, again, the reason why I'm subtracted two is because maybe they're not x-intercepts. Maybe they're imaginary solutions, and those things come in pairs. Okay, so the next thing that I need to do is I need to compute f of negative x. So look at the original function. Anything that has an even power, it's going to keep the same exact sign. Even power keeps the same exact sign. This is an odd power. It's raised to the first power. So it was negative, but whenever I stick negative x in there, negative times negative makes that one positive. It doesn't do that for the even ones because when you square a negative, it stays positive. And then plus 1, that thing doesn't change. Now let's count up the sign changes in this new function. So from positive to negative, right here from the first two terms, there's one sign change. And then from negative to positive, from the negative 3x squared to the x, there's another one. So there's two possible, two possible sign changes. That's two negative real solutions, or I take two away from that, an even number, and I get two negative ones. So now what you want to do is you want to organize all of this in a nice, neat table. So, first thing I'm going to put on there is a total, another column for all the positive possibilities, another column for all the negative possibilities, and then a column for the imaginaries. How many did we have total? We said there's got to be six, because that's what the degree is, and that's what the corollary of the fundamental theorem of algebra was telling us. Okay, now based on the number of positive, now I'm just going to pair these up. I can take two positive ones and pair it up with two negative ones. So if I add those two together, 2 and 2 gives me 4, 4 real solutions. Where are the other two? The other two must be imaginary. So basically what I did here is I added these two up, I get 4, and subtracted from the total. The rest of them have to be imaginary. Okay, so now I've already paired up the 2 with this 2. Let's pair up the positive 2 with the, the negative 0. So maybe there are, oh, that's explaining what I just did there. Maybe there are two positives with zero negatives. In that case, if I subtract the two from the six, that means I have four imaginary solutions possible. Okay, so we've exhausted all the possibilities with two. Now let's move on with zero positives. Zero paired up with two negatives, and that means I also have four imaginaries. And here's the worst case possible. If I have zero paired up with zero, Zero paired up with zero, zero positive, zero negative. That means every single solution is imaginary. And that's a tough situation because how are you supposed to find imaginary ones? You're supposed to find them with the quadratic formula, right? That's the only method that we have. So the only one up here that we could actually solve would be this top case. So right now you, you might be thinking, how is that tremendously helpful? Well, it tells us, it, it kind of narrows down our possibilities. Um, there's sometimes when you use this, and, and maybe you'll see this in the examples that you have to do, where it lists out all the way down, there's nothing but negative, no negatives, zero, 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 zero. That just cuts all of your possibilities in half. You don't have to try any negatives that can only be positive, and, and that's something that's helpful. Something else is helpful is that no matter what, you can see in every single one of these cases, no matter what, I'm gonna have some imaginary solutions. And the only way that I can get those is from uh, from the quadratic formula or completing the square. So going into a situation, going into a function, that might be some helpful information. Okay, so you have a couple to try down below, yeah? And uh, in the meantime here, um, here are the rules all written out, like step by step what you should do. So we're going to use the Descartes rule of signs to determine the number of possible types of zeros, either positive reals, negative reals, or imaginary ones. So the first one is figure out how many you're supposed to have. What's the total number of zeros I'm supposed to have? And that's the degree. 
Number two, you're going to count up all the sign changes in the original function. Where does it go from positive to negative or negative to positive? You write that number down, and then whatever it is, take two away from it. And keep taking two away from it until you have none left. So for example, if you count up and you get three sign changes, take two away from that, I get one. And I stop there because if I took two more away from that, I'd have negative one. All right? If I did all of this and I had four sign changes, take two away from that, I get two. Take two away from it again, I get zero. And those would be your possibilities. Okay? Step three, do the same thing on f of negative x. To find f of x, negative x is so easy. All you got to do is go through and change all the signs of the odd powered terms. Very, very simple. And then do the same thing. Count up all your sign changes, write that number down, and then take away 2 until there's nothing left. Step number 4, pair these things up in a table. Pair up some of your uh, positives with the negatives, and then add those two together, subtract it from the total, and see how many imaginaries you can get from that. Now, all right, all right, that sounds reasonable. Um, okay, so here was the lesson on the fundamental theorem of algebra. We had lots of stuff packed in here. We talked about the fundamental theorem of algebra saying, hey, you have a polynomial function with real, uh, real coefficients. That means you have to have at least one complex solution. Corollary said, if you have n, n the degree polynomial, you have exactly n solutions. Some of them repeat. However many times they repeat, that's called its multiplicity. The second one is illustrated right here in this little picture of this figurine sitting on the chair. The behavior of the zeros at, um, or the behavior of the graph at the zeros. So if you look at the, the girl's bum, her bum is tangent to the chair. That must be an even multiplicity. And whenever her her feet are just kind of crossing through. If you imagine uh, the plane of the chair as being the x-axis, it just crosses straight through, then that must be an odd multiplicity. So that's, you can see that her, her body there kind of makes a, a cubic looking function. That's kind of interesting. Okay, so the third one, conjugate theorems, imaginary and irrational ones always come in conjugate pairs. And then finally, Descartes rule of signs. Uh, counting up sign changes and determining how many positive or negative possible posi real solutions that we have. Mm, tongue twister. All right, so here's your uh, assignment. Notice that there are two sets of two worksheets. Get those both printed out for me. And uh, look at Rowan right there, little gauss. He added up the numbers from 1 to 100. He got 1550, and he's right. That's the correct answer. All right, see you guys in class.